Bucktown is nothing new. It started in the early 19th century. Among the few things about it, it's not hard to guess how it got its name. The name comes from the large amount of goats that roamed the once open fields. It originated from Polish town. The name is actually translated from Polish. Cozy Prairie, a goat prairie. As time passes through the busy streets of North Avenue and Damon, Goat Prairie becomes anything but a prairie. Many people found work in Bucktown. In the early 1830s to 1840s, they would go to the leather factory to make things like coats and chairs. It attracted many people and helped boost its popularity. The worst part about it, though, is when you drive down Elston, you can smell the factory, the worst smell known to man. The factory was a proud part of Chicago in the 1920s when Chicago began to bloom. Polish people started to move out of the town. In came the Germans. They captured their own neighborhood within the neighborhood titled Holstein Park. Eventually, when the metro was built, Bucktown became a hit. The population increased and many people visited. During this incline in population, three beautiful cathedrals were built. The streets surrounding these cathedrals were named by the original Polish and German settlers. German street names were changed. Well, you can guess why. During World War II, many Polish people moved into the town, increasing the Polish population. After World War II, the increase slowed down. Eventually, a new group of people moved in. In the 1960s, Latino people moved to Bucktown. Slowly, the population of Polish people decreased, and the neighborhood was mostly Latino. This is where Bucktown changed. In the 90s, Bucktown started to have rallies, protests, prostitution, and carjackings. Many people would participate in the rallies against gentrification to support its ethnic roots. This was significant for the town because it helped advance the power of what could go on in Bucktown. A great book about Bucktown during this time is A House on Mango Street. Many gang shootings and wars took place towards the Wicker Park side. In 1998, my father, Scott Trotter, bought a house on Wabansia, a street towards the shopping area of Bucktown. In his words... middle class. Whenever you're ready. When we first moved in, the neighborhood was more of a working class, uh, slowly turning into kind of like a middle class neighborhood. And uh, it seemed a little more eclectic. There certainly were more artists over here and um, people that I can't, I have no idea. Okay. Okay, you're moving the camera. Whenever you're ready. Is it running? Yep. Okay. I think the biggest changes that have occurred in the neighborhood over the last 20 years or so is that we, the, this neighborhood had a core component 
of people who had lived here for decades and decades. And most of those people were uh, primarily of Polish descent. And it, it, it you know, the, the ones that were still around, it was, you know, we had sort of a mix of, of, you know, the older folks that had been here and lived in somewhat of a tight knit community. And the, you know, there were big, you know, a lot of students and artists and young professionals that moved into the neighborhood because of its close proximity to downtown, be, being able to get in and out of downtown fairly easily. It had a vibrant nightlife and, uh, you know, really felt like kind of the, you know, artists and musicians side of town. And over the years, that has, you know, changed somewhat dramatically. It is still, uh, got a vibrant nightlife and probably a more eclectic and better, you know, restaurant scene representing more culturally than it had in the past. Um, the, you know, there, you know, stretches of the main streets that had had no storefronts, no or businesses or, or, or boarded up businesses or uh, places that were auto repair shops have changed to the types of businesses that one would find on Oak Street, like Mark Jacobs, um, you know, and uh, although that has recently left the neighborhood. So we've certainly seen a huge shift from uh, working class, somewhat, you know, empty storefronts to a, you know, bustling, almost suburban mall set in the city uh, as far as the, you know, the main streets go. We've also seen a big shift where we've lost a lot of uh, affordable housing on uh, all kinds of levels, but it was a neighborhood that, you know, had many multi-flat buildings, two, three, four flats, and we've seen uh, stretches where those buildings have been uh, you know, torn down and where once you might have had six, eight, twelve, sixteen units, uh, the multiple buildings get torn down and maybe one or two or three single family homes go up in their place. Um, when we moved in here, this had been a two flat and there were uh, a brother and a sister living here and still sort of living in it as a two flat, although they had uh, made some modifications in the home, so it was really, at that point, uh, a single family home. But uh, when we moved in, we finished the conversion that they had started. And there were a number of people that had done, you know, that type of thing that we had done back then, but it was not super dramatic, like the, the change we had made, uh, you know, they, we were offsetting a brother and sister that had been living here by, uh, a husband and a wife taking over the space and then having children, you know, move in. Um, you know, and that, that was certainly also another thing that was a big difference during the time that, we were, that we've been here, um, is that y prior to 2000, you seldom saw someone go down the street with a stroller. And that was something that, uh, you know, really that seemed to be the baby boom year. And it, it, it really changed overnight from being a neighborhood where you really seldom saw a baby to, uh, you know, babies everywhere. And it was, that was something that was interesting because it, the old guard that had been here for a generation or two, um, you know, a number of the people, certainly the, all the ladies that in their 60s and 70s and 80s were thrilled to see this sort of, uh, new life happening in the area. I think a lot of the people that had been moving in and moving out were more transient and uh, moving in for the cheap rents and uh, staying uh, to a point to, in their career till they moved up so that they could live in a better neighborhood or got to a point where they were about to have a child and realized that this neighborhood wasn't going to be able to support them in a way that they would have wanted with a, you know, f uh, free public schools that were uh, acceptable, which uh, this, this neighborhood really didn't have at the time, and uh, now it certainly does. Noli! Yes. 
So you have no idea what I said, so you're going to have to take it or leave it. Next. The interesting part is what went on while he moved his family from downtown Chicago to this house. Around 2000, uh, when Violet was born. And when she was born, uh, you know, we had already been, uh, you know, not going out as much anymore, not staying up as late anymore, you know, uh, with a baby on the way, not seeing what was going on. Uh, on, on the street as much late at night, and but with a new baby in the household, that meant uh, feedings uh, in the middle of the night. And your mom uh, was breastfeeding, so she was the one who would uh, get up and feed in the middle of the night. And um, and she, the, you know, like the first night or two, would hear uh, you know this click clacking out on the sidewalk that. Uh, she thought was unusual and didn't know what it was, you know, that it, it, she just kept hearing it, uh, it constantly sounded like, you know, high heels. And she finally, I don't know how many nights it took, it opened up a window and looked out the front and realized that there uh, was a prostitute or, uh, I don't know at what point it became, several, walking back and forth in front of our home. And uh, between 2000 and 2001, this area of the city for many reasons, really became uh, ground zero for the prostitution, not just in the Chicago land area, but according to the police, this was really, uh, you know, the, 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 the place to go in the Midwest, you know, where, you know, the internet had been around for, for a bit, but, uh, you know, it wasn't something that everybody was online at that point, but, uh, uh, but, uh, you know, people that were looking for this kind of thing could go online and look for prostitution in, in the Midwest or in Chicago, and basically our block would come up, apparently. And so we, uh, we moved out for a bit of time to redo the home, and during that period of time when we moved out, people were doing the house across the street. There were a couple empty lots in a row, um, a six-unit building that only had one couple living in it. Uh, the buildings on either side of us, the first level on one building had nobody living in it, and uh, the, the building adjacent to us, another six-unit building, only had two or three people living in it. And so, uh, and people that were very quiet, didn't, you know, weren't out at night, weren't having a lot of people over. And so, they're, they're just in our block alone, it was really pretty, for the year that we moved out to redo the building, it was really empty. And, and really dark. Uh, none of these buildings had like carriage lights on the front steps. And we didn't like tonight, like, like it is now, we've got a, a street lamp right out in front of the building. And that got put in, in part due to the, the, the prostitution problem. But um, w there, were, there were very few street lights running down Waldansia. And so it, it, it was an area where it was, you know, our stretch was really dimly lit at night, really d with dark places and, you know, uh, it, but the, the area as a whole was pretty, was pretty dark, you know, not, not a lot of good street lights. Um, and it was, but it was a pretty safe area. And uh, apparently for decades, the area in Chicago anywhere where, where there was a lot of prostitution apparently was on North Avenue near uh, Troop Street. And that's, and, uh, and uh, maybe between Kingsbury and Troop. And, you know, in the late 90s, that's when Home Depot went in. Apparently they told uh, the city, if we're going to come in and spend this kind of uh, money to redo this area, you're going to have to, uh, you know, do something about the crime around here. And so the police, I guess, cracked down on the prostitution, moved it along, and where it wound up was in this neighborhood. And... What it, it wound up taking was really a community effort to move it along. And it, 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 on the weekends, beginning at, you know, probably about midnight, our street, again, sleepy, so even though we're only a block off of North Avenue, it's always been, you know, like you're already in a neighborhood in a pretty quiet street. Um, you know, beginning again in 2000, 2001, um, it, it, at night, our street, both in both directions would be like what North Avenue would be like on, in rush hour on a Friday. 
and it would be bumper to bumper, a lot of commotion outside, uh, prostitutes on both sides of the street, you know, yelling back and forth to each other, you know, guys getting out of their cars. I mean, it was just a circus. And we'd call the police. It's, it would seem like the police wouldn't do anything. There wasn't a whole lot they could do unless they were doing some type of sting where they were actually seeing, you know, a transaction take place. Um, and, you know, they, they would arm us with ideas of what we could do in order to uh, try to alleviate the problem. One of them was to, anytime you saw uh, a, a prostitute sit down on, on uh, private property, somebody's home front steps, you could call the police and it would be considered trespassing. And since the sidewalks are pretty narrow along here and people's front steps are right on sidewalks, they would often be sitting down. And the police knew you could call 911 and they would just zoom right in. And that was one of the ways they were they would move, try to move people along is just arrest them for trespassing, which was, you know, kind of a bogus trumped up charge, but it was something they could do. Um, you know, uh, the police also offered up that they didn't believe that the the, 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 they would really be able to move the problem along it in its entirety because uh, Mayor Daley, it was a problem that he liked to have in that it was very lucrative for the city. The city could uh, come in and maybe once every month or two have a sting, arrest a whole bunch of people in, in one weekend or one night and make apparently tens of thousands of dollars off of, uh, one, of one of the big charges that they made money from was impounding the car of the John trying to pick up the prostitute. And so if they could take, you know, 10, 15, 20 cars, I think the police said that the city would, you know, get upwards of $1,000 a car. It was a, a big, big night for the police. And, and so it was something that they, they, they didn't mind uh, clamping down on here and there, but they didn't want to eradicate because it was a, a good revenue stream. Um, but they, you know, uh, but the, the neighbors got together and really went out every night, uh, or on the weekends anyway, and would go out in groups, uh, you know, midnight, uh, one in the morning, uh, groups of 10, 20, 30 people with flashlights, and they'd shine them on everything and shine them on on the, the working girls and, uh, you know, and make a commotion and make it so people wouldn't want to be around here. This pushed out the low-class families. Sirens were no stranger to the folks who witnessed the prostitutions. So one of the worst things about the prostitution in the area was that it, as I referenced earlier, is that it was not just, you know, a, a major thing happening in this part of Chicago, but it was really the place to go for the Midwest. And it, it had become very highly organized and in a way that was really sort of unsettling, especially when you're living right in the midst of it. Um, if we would call the police, you know, moments later, you would see uh, the cell phones go up to the ear of, you know, of the woman walking on each side of the street, and then they would all duck down, and then a police car would go by, and they wouldn't see anything, and then they would all get back up again. And it was, I, I don't think that it was, organized as much as that, you know, that someone was necessarily listening in on a police scanner and then getting the word out, as much as maybe there was sort of like a flag man, if you will, uh, at the at the ends of different blocks, and they would, you know, put a call out to everybody that, uh, um, that the police were coming. And you could, you know, see that this was not just 
you know, independent people working on the street because this was their last resort or, you know, as it had seemed to be with the, the, the rare prostitute that we would see, you know, in the mid-90s. But, um, and then you would start to actually see pimps standing around, really scary guys standing in the alleys and, it, you know, that, uh, you know, sort of lurking in the shadows. And it just, it, you know, it added a whole other uh, real element to the situation that, uh, you know, made it seem scarier and that, you know, there were people that were potentially watching your house and that uh, if you did call the police and somebody did get in trouble, that uh, there could be retribution. When you, whenever you call 911, one of the things they ask is whether or not you want to leave your name and number. And uh, to, to, and, and when they ask you and you're in that spot, you're sort of thinking, well, if I don't, then perhaps they won't take this uh, call seriously or, you know, maybe they won't even write it down. And that, uh, you know, uh, but after speaking with the police, they had indicated that when you call 911, you don't almost never want to leave your name and number because uh, those records can become public. And if somebody is, uh, it gets upset that you were the one that, uh, caused uh, their business trouble, uh, you could see retribution. So uh, it had been advised to me, uh, sort of on the down low by the police, to never do that. But um, as, as we saw things ramp up, uh, one of the things that happened uh, was late one, late one night, you're, this would have had to have been in 2001 after we moved, into our, moved back into the home and we were living in the upstairs back of the house. Prior to that, we'd been living in the downstairs front of the house, but we're in the upstairs back of the house. And so you, uh, one night your mother heard what she described as like a blood curdling scream and uh, woke me up. And I'm normally a very light sleeper. So, and, and she, she was also a very vivid dreamer. And so if I, if I wasn't the one getting woken up, that was a little odd. Um, so I thought that maybe it was something she'd heard as a dream and I wasn't overly concerned about it, but I got up. She wanted me to, you know, go check outside. I, you know, you know, went out on our back deck and couldn't hear any, any commotion or anything like that. Um, uh, so I came back inside, but she was really, really upset. I'd never seen her like that about hearing something outside. And she called the police and the police over the phone took down whatever she had to say, but didn't send anybody out. And we fell back asleep. And then very early in the morning, you know, four or five in the morning, there was a pounding on the front door, and it was the police at that point, and uh, they wanted to hear whatever she had said over the telephone, they wanted to hear it in person again, so she let them know, and I can't remember if it was at that point or, uh, you know, after another visit that uh, we had heard that the reason why they had come to the home at that point was that they had found a body of a woman on, uh, within a mile of our home on Bloomingdale Street uh, just west of Western, which at the time was a pretty desolate area. It's still pretty quiet along Bloomingdale there, um, but uh, you know, uh, but but then it certainly would have been uh, really, really quiet and deserted. Um, and the police searched our alley, you know, canvassed the area, and wanted to try to tie that body to. Our, you know that our immediate area, but we're unable to do so. And uh, later that day, I went outside and I decided I'd look around the alley myself. And uh, in it, you know in the sunlight, I was able to see uh, something silvery and glittery uh, in the you know sort of the grass growing up along the side. And it w it turned out that it was a necklace with the with Wu Tang from the Wu Tang the Wu Tang Clan. Uh, in a charm on the front of the necklace, and it had what was very clearly blood on it. And so at that point, I called the police again. They came back, got the necklace, and verified that uh, it did tie that woman to that spot. It was her necklace, and it had uh, either come off in a struggle or been yanked off her neck. And at the time, they had uh, told me that they had they that the woman had a past as a prostitute. She had somehow was, uh, you know, had gone the straight and narrow and had gotten a job at Target doing a night shift and, uh, and had come back out on the streets after one of her shifts. And they thought that 
pr that perhaps what had happened was she'd come back out as an, as an independent uh, person and her pimp found her and or her previous pimp found her and uh, was upset and, 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 and killed her. And, uh, you know, this is, you know, very upsetting for, you know, everybody in the area. And I don't know how long it was after that that it, everything got shut down uh, and, and whether, never knew whether it had anything directly to do with that or not, but um, it seemed in, in a pretty short order we had a major prostitution problem for a year or two and then, like overnight, it was completely gone. Um, but one uh, interesting and sad note with that story is in my news feed, just in this last month, there was a story that uh, someone has been using data to determine that they're uh, that, that looking at all the murders in Chicago. Um, looks like your telephone is ringing or something. Oh, that's annoying. Take two. Um, it, so in my news feed was uh, that it, it, an individual had, you know, sort of crunched the data of unsolved crimes in Chicago and come up with, uh, you know, this, this wasn't the police, some outside person or group had come up with... Um, you know, what they believed was a serial killer that had been operating since about 2001 and is, you know, still up until, you know, even this last year, uh, there, there have been, you know, a number of deaths each year that seem to fit into the same MO, I guess, or, or near enough of it that it, it uh, triggered something with uh, the whatever program they they drawn up to crunch the data, and uh, it, it's somebody who's operating on the west side, but pretty much the length of the city, and I decided to, uh, there was a, a map with pinpoints on it of all the people who've been murdered that seem to fit this profile, and I, you know, was intrigued, so I uh, zoomed in on it, and, and, you know, with the full city and zoomed in to as close to this neighborhood as I could. And what I came up with was somebody that was uh, a, a body that was found on Bloomingdale, just west of Western, right around the time that uh, uh, this this body would have been found. That uh, that the police, um, you know, thought that perhaps it was a, an enraged pimp, um, and that was the the, the 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 one body that was fairly near our home. Um, and it, it, you know, showed up as being in the same point in time in 2001, and it, uh, um, it and that was the very earliest uh, dated uh, person uh, that they, uh, murdered person that they found that, that would fit in this profile. So that might be something you, Nolan, want to uh, look into some more and maybe uh, have a connection to this. Uh, what this neighborhood was like to, uh, uh, you know, it's a very tr tragic story that uh, looks like, um, you know, is potentially tied into a citywide serial killer. So with that uplifting story, um, I'm going to get up and press the pause button and leave the rest of this to Mr. Young Mr. Trotter. Even though the neighborhood began to incline in wealth, the violence continued. Eventually, the prostitution faded away and violence moved east to Wicker Park. In the mid-2000s, shops began to invade North Avenue, Milwaukee, and Damon. At this point, Bucktown became one of the most popular neighborhoods in Chicago. In the 2010s, my mother, Jennifer Trotter, moved to a coach house just east of the actual park in Wicker Park. At this point, I realized how much violence there was 
There would be gunshots nearly every other week and gang shootings once a month. Many people died in the streets. One day I left my backpack in my mom's car. The next morning, it was gone. Nothing was safe next to the park. Nothing at all. Then, as years went by, the violence calmed. A great restaurant would come and leave, and so did the shops. Bucktown continues to grow. The neighborhood is becoming extremely expensive. Hundreds of people wake up every day here and take the Damon stop to work. Music venues are so popular. So are themed bars. And nothing is new about this. You can find these all over Chicago. But it's special to me because this is what I've grown up around. To end things, recently a serial killer has been roaming the streets of Bucktown. I don't joke. One of the victims owned a Wu-Tang necklace. The same as the one my father found. The violence did leave, and now it returns.